All right, I want to welcome all of you joining us by, however, joining us, internet, television, or radio. And we thank you for joining us, and we're glad you could come. Turn to Mark chapter 16 in your Bibles, or excuse me, uh, go to Mark chapter 16, but also go to Acts chapter 2. And I wanted to share something here, first out of Acts chapter 2, then we'll go to this other scripture. And a few others real quick. Acts chapter 2. If you go down to verse 14 of Acts chapter 2. It says, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you. and Hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now notice this. Your, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. <laughs> that didn't make me feel real good this morning. But anyway, verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders. Notice this. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vaporous smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved now i want to talk about some things this morning to you because in america we got to get hungry and realize what god can do Amen. because god has done not only marvelous things across the world but in america and there's always some land that is in massive revival or something, you know. And uh, but this morning, I have to tell you what happened to me. I woke up, uh, normally on, on Sunday mornings, I'll get up at maybe 6.30, 7 o'clock, depending on, I try to get as much sleep as I can sometimes. Uh, I, I'm, I popped, my eyes popped open, I looked over at the clock, it's 5.30. I said, I'm going to try to get us another hour. We had the grandbabies over and stuff yesterday and, and, and the kids and, and uh, you know, that'll wear you out. <laughs> so I was trying to get, you know, a little bit more sleep. So I, I fell back asleep. It must have been 45 minutes is all I slept. I woke up at 630. But I had a very vivid dream. I mean, it was vivid. It was like it was more real to me than, you know, actually being there. That's how vivid this dream was. I mean, it was something else. And in this dream... I was standing outside somewhere in Wisconsin. I knew it was Wisconsin, and we were out here in the woods like we are. And you know how beautiful it is. On, on, I knew it was August, and I knew it was, it was hot August nights. It was like 80-something 80, 80 degrees. And have you ever, I know you have, ever looked up, especially if you're out in the country like I am, and you look up at the stars out here? And a clear night, not a, not a cloud in the sky, the moon and the stars were brilliant, brilliantly shining, just beautiful. It's one of those Wisconsin evenings. And it's warm outside. And I'm standing there talking to some guys and some people, and there's people milling around. And I don't know where I was at, but I knew I was in Wisconsin. I knew it was on a hot August night. I knew that it was just a beautiful, clear evening. And all of a sudden, now listen, I looked up and I saw snowflakes. And I'm going, you know, everybody saw them, and they started looking at, you know, nobody's really saying anything. We're looking at each other like snowflake. There's not a cloud in the sky. And it was snowing in August. It was, it was over 80 degrees. And I'm thinking, that is the strangest thing I've ever seen, snowflakes in August. Then all of a sudden, as we were looking at the snowflakes, it didn't last long. But all of a sudden, have you ever seen a meteor at night? Everybody's seen one of those? All of a sudden, I saw one of those. It was a, one of the most beautiful ones I've ever seen. But then I started seeing them all over the place. And I've seen this before where you see three or four or five of them at one time, you know, whatever it was. It's like a meteor shower, they call it. But this was like thing that got more and more intense. It got to the point where everybody saw it and we got to the point to where there was so many of these things going on. It was like a fireworks display in the sky and it got scary. And I was sitting there going, I didn't know what to think because all of a sudden there was so, so many, many of these things are going different directions and they're shooting across the sky and running into each other and exploding. And some of them were, you could tell, was coming down to the earth. And I thought, oh, 
man, you know, and it's, it's almost like everybody, nobody was saying anything. Everybody had their eyes to the sky and it, you could, sh people were shaking. It was, it was that kind of terror. Not, you know, we, I did not know whether it was good or bad or, or you know, I thought it was bad, you know, at first. These things are, are, are falling in these, and the, you know how the, the rocks or the debris will fall down to earth sometimes, right? This stuff was coming out, you could tell. But I didn't know what to think, but instead of destruction, the things that started falling off of the, these meteorites, it was not rocks, it was like pieces of paper. The only way I could describe it, if you've ever burned any paper and you had the wind come and pick it up and it, and, and some of it was on fire and some of it wasn't and it, was, and it fell on the ground. You know what I'm talking about? It was like kites came down and they were on fire. Everywhere. They were coming down everywhere. And uh, <laughs> so these, 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 these pieces of kite were, were falling everywhere. And I think it was happening everywhere in the world. But people out of curiosity... We're going over and picking up these pieces of paper that were on fire, you know, carefully, and picking them up. Now listen, when they did this, I just knew that these people would be changed forever. Now I was thinking, in my mind, that maybe this was going to be like the zombies movies. You know, where somebody picked it up and they're going to become like zombies or something. You know, like that, you know, like an old 70s movie. Because this is my, my sense of humor. When I'm watching this, I didn't know what to think. But I realized this was not bad. This was good. And they, and, and they, they, re, they got a virus, but it was, it was, it was Jesus. Amen. And they went, these people immediately began to run and spread that virus all over the world. Amen. Then, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, my wife calls me on my cell phone. And I, and, I, and I said, I pick it up, and she, she, goes, she goes, she called me my nickname, and she started saying it over. I'm so sorry. She's crying. She's wailing. She's wailing and crying. And, okay, after all this happened, I began to, and that was the end of the dream. After all this happened, I began to say, Lord, what is this all going? Well, the Lord began to show me that the snowflake, God is going to begin to do things in, that we've never seen before. He's going to break the laws of nature. How many know working in miracles and gifts of uh, special faith and stuff is really, it, it, it goes beyond what we know in the natural. It breaks all the rules of the natural um, laws, even gravity and so on. We're going to see things like we never have seen before. Can you all say amen? amen. And you know, when God starts moving, I got to say this to you. How many know it can be a little scary? People out there that are listening to me, some of the things that I'm going to talk about you've never seen before, some of them are afraid of everything. They're even afraid of tongues, you know. They're afraid of anything supernatural. We've got to learn and understand that God is a supernatural God, and when he begins to do things, it can be awesome, but it's God. If it's God, it's, it's, it's going to be good. Everybody say amen. Now, listen to this, though. The, the meteorite and the showers and, and everything just represents... You know, the, that God is going to pour out that fire of God on, the, on us, but it's a holy good thing. The people went over and picked up those papers. They got saved. They got filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to go out, and, and, and it was really a little embarrassing because I, I just knew that those new people, instead of the old guard or the old Christians who didn't do anything, yeah. were going to run out and begin to share the gospel all over the place because they were on fire. My wife calling me, you know, me and my wife, I didn't go pick up a paper because I've already... You know, I'm already saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. But I sit there and I observe this. When she called me and she started that, I, I, I came to understand that what that represented was that our sin or the things that we do, even the small things that, got, that grieve God that we, that we do sometimes are going to become exceedingly, she was repenting. And my wife really wasn't doing anything really seriously wrong. But even the small things that grieve God, she was sensitive to. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Now listen to this. Yeah. I want you to go over with me to Mark chapter 16, and let, let's, let's read some scriptures here. Mark chapter 16. And I'll, and I'll read uh, a very familiar portion of scripture here. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, 
And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. They shall drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. John chapter 14 tells us, and I want you to just go over there with me because I know you know it, but I want to, for the sake of the people that are, that are listening to me on, on the, uh, the website, John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I send you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Then last but not least, Acts chapter 8, verse 4, I want you to read in that. Acts chapter 8, verse 4, what I see coming is this. Acts chapter 8, I'm over here, and verse 4 says this. Therefore, they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. Technology enables us to scatter abroad and go everywhere. It's amazing to me what God is doing. And it's amazing to me when I study church history. Now listen, church history tells us and shares with us some of the things that God can do. God can not only change a church, not only can he change a, tr a people of a town or a city, he can change a whole nation, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. It is not hard for God to do anything he wants, but he has to find the people that are hungry. And it has to find the people that will ask him. Every great revival, every great move of God, every great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we have, and I believe we have three great outpourings of the Holy Spirit, that, that launch all these things. But great revivals, whatever you want to call them, restorations, sometimes they call them reformations in church history was started by hungry people that prayed. Somebody had to pray and stand in the gap, and they did it long enough, God began to pour out his spirit. Right. Spirit-filled prayer will bring about revival. Amen. People in America are getting hungry. People are praying for us across the nations. Somebody told me the other day, they said, uh, well, do you think there's enough people in America praying and seeking God? I said, no, but God has them overseas praying for us. Amen. Did you all hear what I just said? Yep. And they are serious. They're fasting and praying for us. And when, when that begins to happen, something is going to begin to change. Now, I want to encourage all of you listening to me today, and I'm going to give uh, examples of these great moves of God because God has instructed me to, to prepare people for what's coming. I was mowing my lawn, praying in the Spirit, and God kept saying to me, in fact, I went on a walk, he kept saying to me, I want you to do a series of teachings, and I want you to prepare the people of God for what I'm going to begin to do. Now, I can't totally prepare you because I don't know some of it, but I want as best I can to prepare you. You've got to open your hearts. Get ready because God's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we're able to ask or even think according to the power that's working in us. Amen. And the cold-hearted people, even that are in, in, still in our church and out in other churches, the, even the ones that are cold-hearted or, or, or have lost their zeal for God, they can be brought back into the fold, the backslidden people. Amen. I mean, let me tell you, it's not hard when God starts moving. Now, I want to talk today about John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God confirms His Word with signs following. I want to say this to you. The simple revivals, uh, the greatest revivals that we've ever had on this planet were the ones where people simply took God at His Word the best they knew. Yep. Taking God at His Word is taking Jesus at His Word. The Word of God and Jesus are one. So when we truly believe the Word of God and act on it, things will begin to happen. There was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, or a revival, I would like to say it that way, that began to happen in 1967 or 65 into the 1970s in Indonesia. They call it the Indonesian Revival. Now, Indonesia is a set of islands over, you know, that have a lot of islands, a big nation with lots of islands off of it. There's all oh, thousands of islands, literally, with people on them. And they were really, uh, if you want to call it, very poor and uh, village people and a lot of them real heathens. You understand what I'm talking about? 
not many of them were really educated, but there was one man that is pretty, edu pretty educated, went to school, and he's telling the story of this revival. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that he viewed and saw in this wonderful outpouring or revival. Now, at this particular time, and I want to want to share this because the Lord had me pick this out because a lot of the same things that are in America were happening there. Amen. In fact, uh, you know, parallels kind of the church because at that particular time, he went to a, this particular church called a Presbyterian church, but there, were, there was other denominations, and they were cold. Their, their, their services were cold. Um, they, they, they went to church. They weren't allowed, you know, everything was in order. The way he describes it is like that, you know, you go to some churches, how many have ever been to a church where you get a bulletin and you know it's coming next? You know, it's like one thing and then they do the next thing and then they got a hymnal on there, turn the page, you know, and you know what's happening. And this was what they believed the Bible talked about when the Bible says all things must be done decently and in order. Now, how many know when the Bible says all things must be done decently and in order, that's a good thing. We need to have some order. But how many know, praise God, God can mess that up. His order might not be our order. Right. And we need to be uh, open to be led by the Holy Spirit because his order really is decent. And I've seen some things that didn't look so decent in the sense of what we would agree, believe was um, not decent, be decent with God. Amen. If God wants to knock everybody down on the ground and that's what he wants to do, he should be able to do that. In fact, he will do that if he wants to. Are you all listening to me? And it won't be because somebody prays for him either sometimes. It's just the way it is. So here they are, lukewarm, religious. They had a lot of head knowledge. One of the things that, that was really interesting about, about this particular people was they, they would come down and they would say they worship Jesus and everything, but they, they never got to, he said their prayers never got answered. He said if they had an answer to prayer, it was very rare. And he said this, he said if we got sick, we went to the witch doctors. He said, because we got healed when we went to the witch doctors. But we couldn't go to the, the church. So he said people had fetishes. They practiced witchcraft. They did all these sins in private, in their private life. But yet they showed up for church on Sundays, you know. Kind of like people today in America. Now, but the very interesting thing about this, the most interesting thing about this, is that they had the order of a graveyard in this church. And he said on September 26th of 1965, about 200 people in this church gathered for prayer. And, uh, but their prayer services were, were, were very controlled and dead. They, their worship services, you could not raise your hands. If you raised your hands up like this, they'd throw you out of the church. In fact, the women couldn't talk at all in church. You know, that type of thing. He says, but they were gathering for prayer. And then all of a sudden, as they were praying, he said they heard a sound. It sounded like a rushing wind or a small tornado, because they do have them there. And it sounded like that. They began to hear the sound. They said, when they began to hear that, it was, it was a holy hush hit the whole place. Nobody moved. Nobody said anything. And they were sitting there at, at, and listening to this sound, like a rushing wind. And all of a sudden, uh, across the street was the police station. And the police station also served as a place where they would ring a bell if there was a fire. And as they were all sitting there hearing this sound uh, and being quiet, they heard the bell start ringing for the fire. And what happened is people would come because they didn't have a fire you know, team. They would come and guys would all get together and try to put out the fire as best they could with, with buckets and stuff. And people started coming because the fire was on the church. But it wasn't a regular fire. It was God's fire. The glory of God literally was burning on the church, but the church was not burning. And these people were sitting in the church, and all of a sudden people, it, they started out of this prayer meeting with 200. Next thing they knew, they had 1,000 people in this church. And all of a sudden, some of the strangest things began to happen. <laughs> Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. What happened? Well, one, the first thing that happened was a girl of all things, a woman, raised up her hands and started praising God out loud. Right. And, he, and he said you could tell the pastors were shocked by this demonstration of such a thing like this. <laughs> started praising God. And what was really interesting is all of a sudden, he said, 
this one lady standing in front of him started lifting her hands and praising God. And she started, she started going off. And see, he was educated and knew English. And he also knew German, this man. Now these people, this woman was completely, she was uneducated. Most of them were very uneducated people. Most of them hardly knew their language, let alone any other language. This lady starts praising Jesus in English. She said, oh, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I want to, I want to take up the cross and follow you. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Uh, oh, I worship you. On and on it went. Now, the two pastors, that, that are the leaders of the church, were freaking out. They thought she was speaking gibberish. I've had people uh, on my, the Internet tell me that when we gave tongues and interpretation, that was not right. It was just gibberish. Let me tell you something, folks. Some, somebody might see something that they think is gibberish, but let me tell you something. It, it's God. Because, you see, uh, supernatural other tongues might not sound good to you. It might, might sound strange to you. Sometimes it can, it can sound like stammering tongues or, uh, and so on. But let me tell you, that's how God will speak to us. And, and, and this woman was praising and worshiping God in English. Then another guy starts praising and worshiping God in German. And this began to spread from one person to another. Pretty soon, most of them were laying on the floor, had their hands up as God poured out his spirit, like on the day of Pentecost. The pastors jumped up when they heard this lady do this, and they started jumping all over and shouting and saying, say, saying Lord, if this is of the devil, please stop it. Please stop it. We bind that in the name of Jesus. If that's not, if that's not of God. And you know, a lot of people don't think that a lot of these things are of God that are happening. You know, but they, they, and they were saying, Lord, stop it. Lord, we bind that. And the, the louder they would pray, the more it would happen. Amen. <laughs> so God overrode Amen. their ideas and began to pour out the spirit. And they began to speak in, in other tongues. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. But it kept spreading and it kept spreading and it kept spreading. So pretty soon, people were coming from all over the town. And what started with 200 people, it grew into about 1,000 people. And it continued to grow and start in this little church. And they started meeting every night to pray. And God kept pouring out his spirit and kept pouring out of his spirit. Then some things began to happen. As God began to pour out his spirit, and people got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they, get, they got baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. This became very much, the Lord told them, you don't get the Holy Spirit because they were taught that you get the Holy Spirit when you're saved or whatever. He taught them, and these were uneducated people, definitely, that you got filled with the Holy Spirit and got tongues. They knew that, see, because they saw it out of the Bible immediately. And they began to pray. Everybody was praying in tongues. <laughs> and what was really interesting is all of a sudden, God began to deal with personal sins. Now, how did God deal with them? Well, it's very interesting because how many know when you're praying, praise God like that for a few days, God's going to deal with you? Huh? When the Holy Spirit comes like that, he's going to deal with you and give you an opportunity, praise God, to get it right. But you see, some people like to hide things. And let that sit there for a minute. You say, well, Pastor Tom, God won't embarrass anybody. Hey, let me tell you something. When revival starts, he'll embarrass people if he has to. Amen. Because he cares about them enough. See? Now listen to me. They started getting, some people started, the gifts of the Spirit started manifesting. And it's not like we see in the church today. It was some of that, but it was a little different. Like women in the church would get a word of knowledge. It seemed like God wanted to use women because, uh, you know, women weren't supposed to be, you know, doing these things and all of a sudden a woman in church would go up to a man once she went up to this one man and said the lord shows me that you're you, you're committing adultery with a woman and his wife was there and you better get it right and he said oh no i'm not committing an adultery with you know and he oh he, he was rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and she kept telling him she said you better get it right all of a sudden conviction came on this man and he started repenting before everybody he was committing adultery and his wife got really mad at him his wife was getting all over his case so another lady came up with a word of knowledge about her sin everybody say amen this was, this was happening all over. People who would not repent and were holding on to pet sins and would not get, out, get rid of them, it was exposed Amen. so they could repent. Now, how many know that's different yeah. than what we're used to in America? But I've seen this. I saw this in a service in Elko, Nevada. 
I did not preach on sin. I did not preach a strong message of, of, or on anything like that. I was preaching on money and the blessing of the Lord. When I sat down, the, I, asked, I said, I'm closing the meeting. The, the, the uh, uh, pastor got up to close the meeting, and the pastor's wife said, you know what? I feel like we just need to worship God for a minute. So they started worshiping God. And all of a sudden, a man got up. He walked up to the front. Nobody told him to do this. And he said, can I say something? And she said, well, go ahead. And uh, gave, him, gave him leave to say something. And he confessed the most grievous sin in front of everybody. And the next thing I saw was another person came up and did the same thing. Nobody egged them to do this. It was not anything I did. I didn't pull on them to do any of this. I was just sitting there. I saw one after another begin to confess of the most hideous sins that would be embarrassing to say in front of people. And I saw the power of God hit that, that, that place and begin to shake that place. Folks, I've seen this myself. And it was the Holy Ghost who did it. It was supernatural. It was awesome. It was not of the preacher trying to make it happen, for God's sakes. It wasn't the preacher trying to, you know, tell everybody how wrong they were or preach them under conviction or any of that. It was the work of the Holy Ghost doing something, and, and I've seen this, and this is what began to happen here. All of a sudden, this one person got up and said, I, God shows me that you're hiding liquor in your house. And the guy would not, he just would not, he said, no, I'm not. And she, and, she, and, and, and she kept telling him, you got, you got liquor hidden in your house. You need to get delivered, you know, repent of this sin. Get this out of your house. You know, a lot of Christians today think drinking's okay. Yeah. It wasn't there in the Indonesian revival. Are you all listening to me? Yeah. God wanted all of that stuff out, including smoking. Yeah. He even dealt with that. But here's the thing that was so interesting. This woman kept... Uh, tell him, you, you, you got 24 hours to repent. God's given you 24 hours to repent. Now think about this. And everybody knew it. So the guy said, nah, that's not. He said, I don't have that. You're wrong. You're missing it. That's not of God. He went home. Next day he comes in there. He comes back next day. And she said, oh, have you repented yet? And he, you got in half an hour. He said, I don't have anything. I'm not drinking. I don't have any alcohol in my house. She's, and then 15 minutes, you got, you got 15 minutes. Or you're going to drop dead. 10 minutes. No, I don't have any. Got down to a minute. Counted it down. 10, in front of everybody. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That, that person dropped dead in front of everybody. Smile at me real big. Well, Pastor Tom, is, is that God doing that? No. Let me tell you something. Yes, it's God, but it's, 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 it's a sign of what our sin will do to us if we don't repent. God is holy. Look at Acts chapter 5. Let me show you this. This is a very, very well-known scripture. I don't see why people... There's, there's several of these in the scriptures. But what the Lord... See, when, when revival begins to happen and God really begins to pour out his spirit and deals with us... We need to respond. Can you all say amen? amen? I said last week there's some people even that have left our church that need to, need to repent. And I meant that. Because you see, you cannot cause issues in churches and hide it and think you're getting away with it. It will catch up with you. When, this, when I'm talking about begins to hit us in America... There's more to it than just shouting, jumping, falling on the ground, laughing, and thinking everything's okay. There's going to be a real accountability that comes. We're going to have to live right. Come on. Amen. And there's going to have to be a house cleaning that, that takes place. Can you all say amen to that? That's true. I know that people don't like this. And sometimes word of faith people reject this type of thing because they say things like we're the righteousness of God. Yes, we are. But the Bible also says that we are to be holy. Yes, but you know, uh, there's a doctrine going around that, that all of our sins are under the blood, so we never have to deal with that again. Yes, we do. Because we are still human beings walking on this earth. We make mistakes, and God wants us to acknowledge that. He wants us to get the sin out and keep the sin out of our lives. Now, he's talking to me, and he's talking to you, and he's talking to everybody that's listening. We need to get right before this happens so we aren't going to have to go through a situation like that. Amen. See? Amen? 
Now look what happened here in Ananias and Sapphira in verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep, keep back part of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart, that thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? See, when God calls you out on something, don't lie to him about it. Right? So here, this person lied to God, and Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all that heard these things. Can you imagine what happened in that church when that happened to that person? Great fear came upon them. What, is, what does it mean, great fear? and awe and respect for God, which we do not have at this point in, in our church or churches across the nation. We don't approach God the right way. We don't, we don't reverence God the right way. I'm on. We need to make some adjustments in this area. Okay, now don't get mad at me. All right? I'm just a messenger boy. We need to change our way of thinking about church. When we approach church and we get together, even in your own lives, we know it's a holy thing. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. We know that we are there to worship and respect the uh, God, the word of God. We need to be on time. We need to be together. We need to get together. We need to be in one accord. We can't come with bad attitudes. God's going to deal with all of these things. Like I said, when Stella called me, I knew that even small things became exceedingly sinful when God's glory was poured out. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's the way it's supposed to be. Can you all say amen to that? I remember somebody says, well, you know, Pastor Tom, I don't believe that God would embarrass anybody like that. Let me tell you something about God. He embarrassed me several times in my life in front of everybody. And it was not fun at the time because, uh, you know, I, I was trying to get into the ministry and it wasn't time yet. And I had a guy pull me out, an apostle of God. This was back in 1980s. And he pulled me out in front of the whole congregation and said, you're not ready yet, Tom. I know you're chomping at the bit to get into ministry, but this has got to happen. This, and he just went down a list about things in my life that needed to be squared away in front of everybody. We don't see a lot of prophecy like that, but we're going to begin to. You know, I've been mu mu um, uh, musing over some of the prophecies that I've had and some of the things people have said to me. And Larry Huggins uh, pointed at me one time and said, Tom... God is going to give you a stronger anointing of rebuke. And, you know, I told my pastor, Pastor John, that I said, you know, Larry prophesied that I'm going to have a stronger ministry of rebuke. And he goes, oh, my God, you mean stronger than it is now? <laughs> That's the first thing he said. And we need, we need that. Listen, see, people don't understand the way God is. God will chastise us. He does, but sometimes, you know, he'll even, even, he'll, he'll even have to do it sometimes and embarrass people because, you see, I had a lot of pride at the time and things had to happen in my life. God embarrassed me in front of everybody. Now, listen to this. I was in a service here not too long ago in a place called Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was a few years ago. And I'm preaching away like this, and I'm not talking about anything, you know, uh, heavy, really. I'm just, I'm just ministering. It's kind of a fun service and stuff. And I'm walking around like this, and, I, and it was about the same time, I mean, halfway through my message, right? About like it is now. All of a sudden, a young couple about, oh, these guys' age over here, you know, um, Arthur and Kate, come walking in. You know, you could tell they're a young couple, and I don't, I don't remember if they had a kid or not, but, you know, hand in hand, they're a young couple, a young married couple. I didn't know them from Adam. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, when they came in, I just pointed at them. I said, you, you guys right there. And everybody kind of froze, because right in the middle of my message, I just stopped, and I said, you guys right there. I said, God showed me that somebody right now is trying to rip you off of your inheritance. Little did I know that the people that were trying to rip them off of their inheritance were family members that were sitting right there in the church. $10,000 they had ripped them off. They weren't even telling them about their inheritance. And God dealt with them, and they were able to get their inheritance. How many know that's, that's wild stuff? But you see, those people were crooked yeah. and trying to steal money from somebody that, that was supposed to go to this other person. Yeah. And God wasn't having it. 
And God sent me there because he knew I'd say something. Because when you say something like that, you know, it doesn't make any sense in the natural realm. But let me tell you something. God can do this kind of thing. I have really, really good, I got a friend, and he is something else, this guy. And he's a prophet of God, you know. And, and, and a real prophet of God, this guy. And he's in a service, and there's about 1,500 people in this church. It's a word of faith church. And packed out with people. And, he's, and, and him and two other preachers, well-known, they're all well-known preachers, were in this service, you know, this series of meetings. There were three, three of them, and they were all there, and two of them were sitting over here. And my friend was up there, and he's preaching, and the Lord said to him, there's three men here, there's three, three couples or men uh, in this church, I guess it was men or couples, and they're committing adultery. They're swapping wives. He showed them they're drinking wine and swapping wives in a church, in, you know, full gospel. And the Lord said, I want you to say that to, to the to congregation because they sinned against this congregation publicly, in private, but it was public. And, you know, they're in this congregation. So he said, I want you to, to say it out loud, and I want you to point it out. And he says, I want you to have them come up here and repent of their sin before everybody. And if they don't, I'm going to send you and the other three preachers out to get them. Now, he didn't know who they were at the time. But he gets up and he says that, and he says, if you don't come up here and repent, me and my three fr uh, preacher friends who were sitting over there, they're just sitting there, are going to come out and get you. And the preacher friends are going, what? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't come up, so they had to go out and get them. And they nailed them. Right in front of everybody. God... The pastors, the leaders, everybody straighten that whole mess out. You're supposed to get a little excited yeah. about this. It's not like I'm going to come up to you right now. Well, maybe I will. You never know. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I've seen it. I've seen God do this sprinkling here and there. You say, Pastor Tom, that sounds really like, no, what that is, you know what that is? That's part of revival and keeping right. People have got to, God's giving us space to get our lives in order. Come on. He's given us space in the body of Christ. He's, he's dealing with people. Everywhere I go, he's dealing with people. Did you know everywhere I go, when I travel, it's not like it is when I preach here. I'm kind of a revivalist, they would call me. When I go out and preach at different churches, me and my wife, did you know one of the main things that's happened is God gets people right? Now listen, and did you know everywhere we go, we cast devils out of Christians? demons really and people say De Christians can't have demons well I crossed that bridge a long time ago and I found out that that's not true Christians can have whatever they allow in and sometimes they don't even know they're there but let me tell you something I just can't help it it happens everywhere we go what's happening why is that happening because if there's demons there, they need to get, get out of there so people can change their lives and get out of these habits and these things they're doing. Would you all agree to that? Amen. God is cleaning up the church, the body of Christ. He's cleaning up people's lives and bondages and stuff from the past and different things. It is absolutely amazing how much deliverance goes on. And I'm not one of these wacko deliverance preachers who go around doing weird stuff. It just happens. has happened since the very beginning of my ministry. But you know what? It's increasing more and more and more. We've had over 300 people now set free from black magic and all kinds of stuff in Pakistan. I'm not even there. It's just an anointing that I have. But you know why? I got to tell you this. We need deliverance in the body of Christ. Amen. We need to get rid of these habits and these pornography habits and these booze habits and these smoking habits and this unforgiveness. Stella shared her testimony. Was it Wednesday? Or was it in church service? Wednesday, uh, uh, listen to this. I'm just going to share what she, what she said. She had a dream early on when we, we were in Reno, Nevada. And in her dream, you see, Stella grew up in a house that, that they were in strife a lot. And she, they all carry unforgiveness. It is very difficult for Stella's family to forgive. They hold grudges for years. How many know that can be a spirit, you know? Well... You know, Stella went along, and she had a hard time with that, amongst other things. Stella, you know, had a hard time with me giving money away at first. But 
you know, those are things, those are just things that, that run in our family unit sometimes, you know. So, so she had a hard time forgiving. People would do bad things or something. She would hold this grudge, you know. And it took her a long time to forgive. And one night she's sleeping and she had a dream. And in this dream, she all of a sudden she saw herself go, leave her body and descend down this dark pit. Kind of like, just like that, that vision Brother Hagen had. Down, 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 down. She was being dragged down and it was dark. But she saw at the end of the, of the tunnel this fire down there. And she's, she's going down. And all of a sudden she began to realize you know, the, Bi the scriptures came to her. She began to realize the Bible says things like this. If I don't forgive uh, my brother, uh, God can't forgive me. And all of a sudden she called on Jesus and said, I forgive, I forgive everybody. I, I forgive, Lord, forgive me for not forgiving and I forgive everybody. And she, just like that, God's hand came and snatched her out of there. But see, it was so vivid to Stella, she's never forgotten that. And I know Christians across the nation that hold on to grudges and bitterness and resentment and everything else and think it's just fine, and it's not fine. The Bible says you open yourself up to the tormentors. And what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. But you open yourself up to the devil, and he comes in sickness and disease and everything else and invades your home with all kinds of habits and different things. And you open the door, and we need to close the doors and get rid of that stuff in the name of Jesus. We have no right whatsoever as part of the kingdom of God to hold a grudge against any other person. None. Amen. Never, ever, never can you hold a grudge or unforgiveness against anybody. Amen. But yet I see it all the time. People start talking about their past. All of a sudden here comes their, their divorce. See, this is one of the reasons that the devil causes divorce. Because when you go through a divorce, you might have all of this stuff that has come up with you and your spouse and the different things that happen, and it's so hard for people to forgive. It's not really all that hard, but they just don't do it. They'd rather hang on to the unforgiveness and bitterness than they would get, get right with that. You know, this is why there's so much strife in the world today. This is why the po politics is like it is. You can actually get angry and start having resentment toward politicians. I have to watch myself all the time, right? These are spiritual sins. You know, Brother Hagin said something that I never have forgotten. No matter what you think about Brother Hagin, he was a man of God. And he said this when he had a vision. One time Jesus told him, I'll judge people faster on spiritual sins than I do natural sins. Attitudes. How people treat one another in churches and pastors and leaders let me tell you, that's a very important thing to God. Now, I know a lot of you don't like, like me keep saying that. You say a lot of preachers are no good. Yeah, God will deal with them too. But let me tell you something. We have no right to come against God-ordained leadership. And if you do that, it's a very grievous sin in the eyes of God. It's, it's very apparent in the, in the scriptures. People go home and talk about pastors and leaders. They eat chicken and roast beef and stuff and talk about them. These seem like little things, and everybody just laughs and says, yeah, that, you know, he said this and he said that. It's amazing to me what I see in church services and what I, see, what's, what I sense. You know, when you get gifts of the Spirit, I want the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Most people wouldn't want it. I had spiritual sons and daughters leave me. Not just a few. Destroyed their lives, every one of them. God said, I want you there. I want you to follow that man. I want you to be, they should be with me today. I should have a worship leader right here. They should have stayed with me for his whole life. And he didn't, and because they didn't, their whole life has just been devastated spiritually. Another guy, he, uh, some of them are, are divorced. Their lives are a mess. They ran off doing other things. And you know what? You can't choose where God puts you. That's up to him. You understand what I'm talking about? It should be up to him. But people do other things because of a lot of reasons. And we have to be careful and prayerful and realize what are we doing when we make these decisions. I mean, these boys decided 
it happened really in their lives as I turned over churches to them. They had a little bit of pride there, you see. And me and my wife work hard, man. You know, God rang the pride out of me years ago. I can't have pride. If I start having pride, I, I probably won't last long. Sometimes I like to be proud of some of my things I do, but you see, I know the secret. The secret is I don't do anything right. It's all about God. The grace of God working in me. Paul said it this way, man, it's the grace of God working in me. You know, and that's truth. All this stuff happened in Pakistan. God does it that way. I don't have anything really to do with it. It's so amazing to me what God can do. Just use a vessel. Just be willing and obedient to God. These boys, they started out, some of them had an anointing on them stronger than me. They could prophesy, and it was like, oh, it was amazing. But yet, you see, they began to listen to another voice when I wasn't there. See, it never happened when I was there. It happened when they left, when I left. And they began to listen to another voice, and they married women that, had, that, that were open and, you know, had a lot of hurt in their past and were open to a Jezebel spirit. And that Jezebel spirit came into their wives and started slowly pulling them away from me, their hearts away from me. Are you all listening? Yep. And the men began to listen to it. And then a chorus spirit came into them, which is a, a spirit. Oh, actually, it wasn't a chorus spirit. It was an Absalom spirit is what I meant. Came into them. And they began, the very, very person that birthed them into the things of God, they begin to pull their support away from us and pull away from us. They pulled away from word of faith. They pulled away from good teaching. They went out into negativity land and began to preach, follow people that were harsh and cruel and critical and try to preach everybody under conviction every week. That became their idea of church. And when they did that, what happened to them it wasn't long before everything just came right, went right down the tubes in their lives. You say, why? Because they allowed a spiritual thing, an attitude, a spiritual sin come in. Amen. Amen. These things need to be dealt with. God's given us space and given you space to deal with these things. Because when he pours out his spirit, he's going to deal with it one way or another. Amen. Can you all say amen? Amen. These great revivals that we're talking about, and I'm just starting this, see, when I get into this, you're going to see people walk on water. You're going to see some of the most amazing things that happen in this Indonesian revival. You're going to see God suspend the natural laws. You're going to see people raised from the dead. You're going to see all of these things happen with these very simple-minded people, even children. God used children. God took children into the jungle alone in groups. And the Lord spoke to them and said, I want you to go to this, go preach, 15 miles away in the jungle. Little children from 6 to 10 years old. And angels would walk with them. And they would see the angels a lot of times. And protect them. Nobody but I was messing with them children. See, this should give you hope. You need to realize and understand when this stuff, this is real stuff, man. And they would go out and preach the gospel in these villages and things would happen. We're going to hear about that. We're going to hear about what God can do when people really begin to believe and trust and let God begin to come. I'm going to close with this. God has always used me as a forerunner. I'm always preaching and sharing things that are going to happen before they happen. Our churches are always forerunning congregations. And God begins to do things. I remember before that uh, great joy thing broke out, we were already having that in our church. And it seemed new to us because we'd never seen it before. Then all of a sudden came on the scene really strongly and just kind of swept through the whole church. And there's a lot of people who don't believe that was of God i never forget the first time I ever got under the power of God like that, laughing, laying on the floor, rolling around. I didn't know if it was, if I, th I thought maybe that was fanaticism. 
before it happened to me. And when it happened to me, all of a sudden I realized when I'm down underneath the power of God like that, a lot of things change in my theology and thinking, right? You ever been there? You know, you get critical about things, you know. I, 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 I. I don't believe that. That sister Jennifer, she, ah, ah, she's out of order. Well, let me tell you something. You'll be out of order. Let me, let me tell you one story, and then I'll close. This is it. I'm standing there in a, one of these type of services where God was, it was just wild in there. Some people would have said it's out of control. I'm sitting up here like this, minding my own business, watching this. There was a lady in our church that was the most dignified lady in our church. She always dressed beautifully. She was very dignified. She never, you would never see her raise her hand. She did not worship. She was stiff as a board. And she was sitting over here in the pew. And right in the middle of what was going on, she rolled out into the aisle. And she did backward somersaults all the way. Backward somersaults all the way down the church aisle, hit the door, and fell out over there. <laughs> now, how many have ever seen that? Okay. I'd never seen that either. I just watched that, and I went, I watched it. I said, there, what in the world was that? But you know what? From that time on, she became the wildest worshiper in the church. Amen. What happened to her is God delivered her from something that was hindering her. The way he does things, though, is his business. I didn't judge it, but by the fruit of it. That's how you judge things. This woman became the greatest, the greatest worshiper in our church after that experience. What happened to her, I never talked to her about. She probably would have told me because it was holy. But something was holding her back from being all she could be in Christ. And God decided that was the time to do it and the way to do it. And who am I to question that? Stand to your feet. Now, I'm not saying we should accept everything that happens in any situation because you judge it by the fruit. But I am saying that God can do things exceedingly abundantly above all I can, we can ask or even think. And sometimes things that he does don't make sense to our minds. In fact, God is, a, is, is really good at wrecking our whole sensibilities about that stuff. Right? The second I think I got it all figured out, and how it's going to go in the church service, God does something different. Serious. That's, that is, the, that is my, the history of my life. The second I think God's, I got it all, how God's going to do this and that, he does something different in a way I've never seen before. Amen. Amen. But in revival that we're coming into, we're going to see God move in all of these wonderful, powerful, and awesome ways. We've got to prepare our hearts, not allowing the devil in, because I'll talk about that as we go. In every great revival, the devil's tried to come in with counterfeits. I'm not concerned about that. You say, why? If we stay on the word, how many know we won't get fooled? And I, and I respect God enough to, to believe this. He'll show us what's right and what's wrong. Right? He'll show me. I said, Lord, I'm sincere. I don't ever want to be deceived by anything. Right? And another thing, too, if we pray and we take authority over these things, the devil can't get in anyway. The only thing the devil can do in my meetings in the name of Jesus is come out of people. He has a right to come out of them. Seriously, I pray that way all the time. You won't do one thing in my meetings. You won't disrupt the meeting. You won't do any of that. The only thing you can do is come out and leave those people. And, and they will if we believe that way. Amen. Father, we pray for all the people this morning and the ones that are out in television land. Help prepare us for what you're going to do in the earth. Many of my dear brothers and sisters, they're not open. They're only open to one way they've seen God move. But Father, in church history, you have shown us that you are a God who is very unique and you are very different and you can come up with all kinds of wonderful things that we've never seen and lord it's part of your plan 
And Father, you use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and you do things, Lord, sometimes called signs and wonders. What are wonders? They'll make you wonder what that is sometimes. So, Lord, we thank you that the true signs and wonders will come into the church and the false ones will be exposed for what they are. And we thank you, Father, for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. amen. Love on one another. Oh, we, got, we communion. That's right. Sit down.